Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash which of course is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma and in this video we're going to be kicking off my long awaited army series talking about the rules specifically for the Soul Blight Gravelords. So this is like my other in-depth series you guys might have seen already for things like Nighthorn, Flesh Eater Courts, Osharak Bone Reapers, Mag King of Nurgle, Glooms by Gits, Beasts of Chaos and Slaves of Darkness just to name a few of them. So if you've liked those series I've done where I've gone super in-depth, covered every single rule for those armies that's written down, then you'll enjoy this series as we're going to be doing exactly the same for the Vampires, Skeletons, Zombies, and all sort of bat monstrosities of Age of Sigma. And if you're interested in one of those army series that I've just mentioned, you can go check them out on the channel. They're all there, they're in their own playlist, so crack on if you'd like to. But going back to the Soul Blight Gravelords, in this series it's going to be something between 10 to 20 hours long by the time we're done with it. And I have already so far done a Y play video on the Soul Blight Gravelords where I was joined by the very nice Alex Tubbs and we went through the strengths and weaknesses of the army to really boil down to the point if it is an army that you would like to play yourself. So you can go check that out if you're still on the fence. And then if you have already decided, I have already done my lore video for the Soul Blight Gravelords where we talked about what are the Soul Blight Gravelords, what is a vampire in Age of Sigma, what are the different types of elements of the Soul Blight Gravelords. It's not all just about vampires. And how would you kill a vampire if you were sleeping with your partner? All of that is discussed in that video. That is also in the playlist of the Soul Blight Gravelords you'll see at the end of this video or on my homepage. But with that aside guys, let us crack on with this video and what we'll be talking about in this video particularly to kick off the rules section is going to be the first part of the rules in the Soul Blight Gravelords. So you can literally go through this series with me as I'm reading it from the book. We're starting on one side and ending on the other. And the first thing we're going to be looking at is going to be the Allegiance ability. So this is going to be your battle traits and it's also going to be the two spell laws of Soul Blight Gravelords. Now normally when we do these sort of bit where we go over the battle traits we do talk about you know command traits available and artifacts of power but as they are locked to the specific sub allegiances the dynasties and legions for the Soul Blight Gravelords that will be covered in the part 2 video which will be the next one in this series. But there is more than enough abilities to cover in this video, let alone going into all the command traits and artifacts which we will cover in the next video. And as always, if you do enjoy the video, please smash the like button and the subscribe button and the bell notification and consider supporting me here on YouTube by becoming a member or on Patreon which we'll get to later on at the end of the video. But firstly, the first rule we're going to be talking about is going to be all about the Masters of death and the first part of this is the cursed bloodlines so the greatest of the soul blight dynasties and legions are mighty beyond measure when you choose a soul blight grave lord's army you must give it a lineage keyword from the list below all soul blight grave lord's units in your army gain that keyword and you can use the allegiance abilities listed for that dynasty or legion on the pages indicated and then it says we've got the Legion of Blood, the Legion of Night, the Veerkos Dynasty, the Castellay Dynasty, and the Avangori Dynasty. And it then goes on to say, if a unit already has a lineage keyword on the War Scroll, it cannot gain an other one. This does not preclude you from including the unit in your army, but you cannot use the Allegiance abilities for its Dynasty or Legion. So what this means is if you were to put Manfred von Karstein as an example, the immortal type of knight, into a Veerkos dynasty, he does not gain the Veerkos keyword, which means he can still be in that army and he is not an ally, he is literally in the Veerkos allegiance for the sub-allegiance purposes of that. But it means, for example, one of the uh, sub-allegiance abilities you get from being Veerkos is re-rolling your casting rolls, and that's something that Manfred would not be able to do. So to summarise the Cursed Bloodlines, this is just basically the sub allegiances and how that mechanic works within the Soul Blight Gravelords that we see quite often copy and pasted in most of the armies. Again, Gleams by Gits and Nighthorn, I do feel sorry for you guys. Then going on to talk about the Supreme Lord of the Undead. I've heard he's incredibly handsome and actually the best character in all of Age of Sigma. I'm definitely an unbiased opinion about myself. Nagash stands the apex of the necromantic hierarchy. 
which translates into, you can include Nagash in a Soulblight Gravelord's army even though he does not have the Soulblight Gravelord's keyword on his War Scroll. If you do so, he gains the Soulblight Gravelord's keyword on his War Scroll and is treated as a general in addition to the model that is chosen to be the army general, but you cannot include any mercenary units in your army. To be absolutely honest with you, most people don't include mercenary units, there may be the odd list and stuff where it works, so that's not really too much of a sacrifice. The fact is he can just generally be your general and you can also have another general in your army so you're not missing out on the whole command trait choice is nice. And what I will say about Nagash is that at first I think when I was talking about Soblet Gravelords when they were first leaked, I sort of I saw Nagash's points cost and I was like this is ridiculous, how can he ever be worth taking? Now I still think his points cost is very high but there are definitely some lists where Nagash does work and definitely some obnoxious lists where he works as well so like nice to see that he fits in here like he did in the Osiarch Bone Reapers but anyway enough with that the next ability we'll be talking about and the real sort of proper one is going to be the Unquiet Dead so at the bidding of their masters the undead rise up from their graves and baleful eyes blazing with dark purpose what this translates into for the rules is after territories have been chosen but before armies are set up you can pick up to two points within your territory and up to two points anywhere on the battlefield outside your territory to be gravesites. Each gravesite must be more than one inch from all terrain features and objectives. So just to mention here what's important is that the gravesite, as far as I am aware, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, is that they're not treated as scenery. So people do tend to think of them as like the scenery piece for the Soul Black Grave Lords, but all they really are is just a point on the battlefield, so that means that they can't be destroyed by like monstrous rampage abilities, etc. They are what they are. And then what do they actually do? So instead of setting up a Soul Black Grave Lord Sample unit on the battlefield, before the battle begins, you can place it to one side and say that it is set up in the grave as a reserve unit. You can set up one reserve unit in the grave for each unit you have already set up on the battlefield. At the end of any of your movement phases, you can set up one or more of these units on the battlefield wholly within 12 inches of the grave site and more than 9 inches from all enemy units. At the start of the fourth battle round, reserve units that are still in the grave are destroyed. So I believe that this is better than Legions of Nagash because in Legions of Nagash, essentially what you had is it basically worked like this, a little bit different, but pretty much the same. But the other addition is that you needed to have a hero nearby. I think there needed to be a hero within 9 inch, might have been 12 inches of the gravesite, to be able to bring something from it. You don't need that. Gravesite can work independently. So that's pretty cool. I do like that. And grave sites are essentially one of the, and basically the main kind of way of doing deep striking against your enemy. Now I know Legions of the Night, and there are other ways in this army to do better deep striking, but that essentially is the main deep striking that every army gets, no matter what, within the Soul Black Grave Lords. So then going on to the Locus of Shaiish. So, the magical power of Shaiish is as relentless as those who wield it. So if an unmodified cast and roll for a friendly soul black grave lord's wizard attempting to cast a spell from the law of the death mages or the law of the vampires is a 9 plus and that spell is not unbound after the effects of that spell have been resolved you can immediately resolve the effects of that spell for a second time. So I like this, it's basically the same way of how it works in Legions of the Gash, but I think it's just written a little bit better and if you're wondering what the law of the death mages and the law of the vampires we will get into that in this video, but they're essentially just the two spell laws you have for your soul like grave lords. Now that does not include magic spells that you have on war scrolls, it is purely just the ones within this book for those two laws. So it's not the spells that Nagash has on his war scroll, Neferata, etc. Has to be from those two spell laws. And then you go on to the deathless minions. So the undead minions of the grave lords are oblivious to injury and push forward unfazed by any resistance. Roll a dice each time you allocate a wound or mortal wound to a friendly soul black grave lord's unit wholly within 12 inches of a friendly soul black grave lord's hero or grave site. On a 6 plus that wound or mortal wound is negated. So this is one of my favourite abilities and that's not because I'm saying it's the best one out there but this was basically like the first ability specifically for death 
uh, Grand Alliance back in that day, which we kind of talked about in the lore video, and it's just nice that it's carried through into the latest edition of what is the most sort of core of what the Death Grand Alliance used to be. So yeah, Deathless Minions, it's good, you know, on the average for the maths, if you do your best to always be wholly within 12 inches of one of your grave sites, that has to be friendly one, that's important, I think before it could just be any, or a Soul Blight Grave Lord's Hero, who is a friendly one, that means that you will know about a sixth of all damage done to you on average on the maths if you can fit those restrictions, which is, you know, no small feat and something definitely, definitely worth remembering, especially how there's a bunch of stuff in this army like the banners for most of the units give you a reroll ones for your deathless save. There's a way in the Castlay army to be able to, like, once per game, be able to have it on a five up for your death save and then you're re-rolling the one, so you can really stack this pretty well, so it's definitely worth remembering that. And talking about actually remembering, before Legion of the Gash, the grave sites didn't actually give you the death save, so that is a new change we've got there as well. And then going on to the next bit, which is reanimated horrors. So to face the armies of the Grave Lords is to confront the end that awaits all life, a feat beyond most mortals. So subtract one from the bravery characteristics of enemy units while they are within six inches of one friendly soul like Grave Lord's Dead Walker or soul like Grave Lord's Death Rattle unit. Or subtract two from the bravery characteristic of enemy units instead of one while they are within six inches of two or more friendly soul like Grave Lord's Dead Walker or soul like Grave Lord's Death Rattle units. And death units are not affected by this ability. Thank you, the law coming through there. But what I will say about this is that, yeah, that's cool, so you can easily, like in the games that I've had, you can easily make the enemy minus two, so bravery, where bravery is a big thing now, because you can only do a spine presence once, of course, in Age of Sigma 3rd Edition. And there are other ways to try and help out bravery, but this is certainly definitely a way to step towards a bravery bomb, especially in, like, Legion of Blood or something, which we'll get to um, in the next video. You could definitely stack that quite well. Um, the only sort of thing I have from the narrative sort of side is, again, you know, very narrative focused myself, is that, so I'm really scared if I'm being attacked by skeletons and zombies, but I'm not that scared if it's a zombie dragon or if it's a Vargeist. It just feels a little bit, a little bit weird, but then again, maybe they're coming from the perspective that if you see like a skeleton warrior attacking you, that's actually used to be a human, i.e. that used to be someone who looked like you. And that's actually what your fate will turn into, or even worse, one of those dead walker zombies. So maybe that was the angle they were going for. And then the next rule we have is endless legions. So across the realms, charnel pits and mass graves blight the land. The grave lords wield the corpses within as a weapon returning them to unlife to serve their will. Which in the game means, at the end of your battleship phase, count the number of enemy units that were slain during that turn and roll a dice, adding the number of destroyed enemy units to the roll. On a 5 plus, you can pick one friendly Soul Blight Grave Lord Sumble Deadwalker or Soul Blight Grave Lord Sumble Death Raptor unit in your army that has been destroyed. If you do so, a new replacement unit with half the number of models in the unit that was destroyed, rounding up, is added to your army. Set up that unit wholly within 12 inches of a gravesite and more than 9 inches from all enemy units. Okay, so this Endless Legion ability is significantly worse than it was in the Legions of Nagash book. And I know that's why a lot of people were upset with this change in the Soul Black Grave Lords. And that's why a lot of people said that the rules in the Soul Black Grave Lords wasn't very good. But I personally think, and it's a very personal, personated opinion this, but if that was entirely your strategy for Legions of Nagash and you're not willing to try anything else that's not actually very creative and was using quite a twisted broken rule to try and win your games. Which, if you want to be offended by that, go ahead. But I prefer the changes here because then it forces you to actually use your brain and engage in different strategies to try and win your games with your vampire armies. And I have to say that this ability is definitely worse than what it was before, and I have forgotten to do it a few times as I feel like I won't get it off. But to be fair, you've always got a chance of doing it because it is on a 5 
Plus, you don't actually have to destroy any enemy units to achieve this. That's something definitely worth noting. And the other thing to say is that it has to be a Soul Blight Gravel Sumble Deadwalker or Soul Blight Gravel Sumble Death Rattle unit instead of it just being like a Sumble unit. And that's how lazy people before just brought back, like I was talking about, those Grimgast Reapers, bringing them back making the Nighthorn players have to pay very expensive points for Grimgast Reapers that weren't worth it because of some people's strategies with Legions of Nagash. So it is definitely worse than choice of what you can summon, but to be honest that's most of the sort of things you would normally do. So bear in mind that you can summon back Graveguard doing this, you can summon back Dire Walls, which would be fast objective grabbing things for later on in the game. It's generally is quite good and there's lots of other options you can pick in between. So I would definitely recommend not forgetting about this ability and it's also a good reminder to have a Gravelord kind of fit back in your territory so that the enemy can't just put a model on it and make it so you can't summon anything up from that graveyard. Keep it a bit safe at the back and then you can bring half of that unit back and again it is half, it's not the full unit as it was in Legions of Agash, so like I've already mentioned, not as good but definitely something still worth doing because if you had a unit of, I don't know, let's say 20 Grave Guards, shall we say, and then you can bring back 10 of them, that's definitely not something to, um, you know, sniff at. I would say Black Knights, but honestly, I think Black Knights is fighting for the worst thing in this book, unfortunately. But Grave Guard are going to be good. Even just skeletons or zombies isn't going to be a bad shout because you can really make a big zombie unit, of course. Or Dire Walls, again, one of my favourite units in the book to be that fast objective grabbing unit. But anyway, so I do um, like the Endless Legion ability and it's something definitely worth noting, even though it's not as good as what it used to be. Or really it's not the same ability of what it used to be as well. So then on to the next one, we've got Deathly Invocation, which is something that has got worse since Legions and the Gash as well. As at the start of your hero phase, you can pick a number of different friendly soul like Gravelord Sumble units, wholly within 12 inches of a friendly soul like Gravelord's hero, to be affected by a Deathly Invocation. The number of different friendly soul like Gravelord Sumble units you can pick is determined by the keyword on the hero's war scroll. So it's simplified to what it was before, where every war scroll was a bit different. You had to kind of like check up just to remind yourself what it was. But they've just got it all written down here. So best case scenario, if you are a Mortark, it can be up to four. With Nagash can also do up to four as well. If it's a Vampire, it can be up to three. If it's a Death Mage, it can be up to two. And if it's Death Rattle, i.e. a White King, it can be up to two as well. And then it goes on to say, if the hero has more than one of the above keywords on its war scroll, choose one of them. So, for example, if you're taking Neferata, you're going to be using the Mortark um, keyword for the purpose of this ability, rather than the Vampire, as you're just going to be able to bring back more models to an extra unit at the end of the day. So then it goes on to say, for each of the units you picked, you can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to that unit, or if no wounds are allocated to it, you can return a number of slain models to that unit that have a combined wound characteristic of D3 or less. Roll separately for each unit. The same unit cannot benefit from this ability more than once per turn. In addition, a unit cannot benefit from this ability and the invocation of the Gash ability in the same turn. So that's what I was saying about the Gash's version of this. And then goes on to say designer note. So some soul blood grave lord abilities and spells allow you to return models to a unit. When you do so, set up the models one at a time within one inch of a model from their unit that was not returned to the unit earlier in the phase. Slain models can only be set up within three inches of an enemy unit if a model in the unit they are returning to that was not already returned in the same phase is already within three inches of that enemy unit. So. If you're brand new to all this and never really played with Soul Black Grave Lords and I, you know, Legion of the Gash stuff, this all may seem a bit new to you. So it might be a bit overwhelming, lots of wordy and stuff. So what this basically means, we'll take it from the top. So we'll talk about when you return those D3 uh, models or wounds. So for example, if you've got a skeleton unit that suffered three casualties and you're going to be trying to bring that D3 back, and let's say you roll that five or that six, being a D3, let's say you roll the six, um, half it because the D3 and then that means you're going to be bringing back three models to that unit. Now let's say you're going to try and bring back um, models to a direwolf unit that has, I don't know, it's a unit of 10, it suffered one casualty, so how does it work? How do you bring that one back? Now you roll a D3 again and if you roll a 6 
and then you half it. That doesn't mean that you're returning three wounds back to the unit. You're bringing back a dire wolf with like three wounds. At, you know, that pretty tough wolf that would be. Um, you just cut the sort of loss at that bit, but you bring back the two wounds that would be able to bring back that one dire wolf um, to health. And alternatively, if you had a unit of um, dire wolves where you had lost a casualty, but the ninth dire wolf has also taken a wound, and you rolled that six for your d3, and then you'd be able to heal three wounds back. You think, oh, a wound to heal back the one that's taken one, and then the two extra wounds that you've managed to return, you can bring back that dire wolf. No, because it's only going to be for a unit if it hasn't sustained any wounds. I hope that made sense and it wasn't too confusing for you, but I just thought that was a good example to use. And then when it comes down to the whole designer note thing of returning the actual models and where you can place them, basically, you can't tie up enemy units into combat, so you can't place them within three inches of an enemy unit. That's not how it works unless that unit was already in combat with them as effectively. Um, and then it's just a way for you to basically not string all your models out and stuff, how you could do or try and put yourself within better range of other things. You can still do that a bit, but um, not as much. And what I will say is when you are returning those models, if you are already bogged down in combat or that unit's not really moving, try and make sure you return the models in a way so they are still wholly within 12 inches of a grave site for the 6-up or one of your heroes if you want to use the command ability or then again just like I say the death is minion 6-up could be a good thought there just basically for your synergies bear that in mind and then what I will also say is that definitely invocation yes it has got worse because you could also use grave sites to heal and a unit can benefit from definitely invocation ability more than one so this is something like um, going to be like um, uh, hypocritical here when I said like if you didn't like the Endless Legion changes, then that means that, you know, you weren't playing the game right. You know, obviously that's really opinionated view, and I'm joking a little bit when I say this, but I think, you know, if that was your one strategy, you need to develop something else. But definitely Invocation was just a way that I used to be able to heal back all my units and just bring back so many Wolves a turn, um, and you won't be able to do it as much, but it's still good. Um, it's just not as good as what it was. So that is that. And with that, we are going to move on to the spell laws for the soul blight grave lords. So, firstly, it says friendly wizards in a soul blight grave lords army know the invocation or a spell in addition to any other spells they know. Any number of soul blight grave lords wizards can attempt to cast invigorating aura in the same hero phase. In addition, you can choose or roll for one spell. From one of the following tables for each wizard in a Soul Blight Gravelord's army. If Nagash is part of a Soul Blight Gravelord's army, he knows all the spells in all of the following tables, which is cool because before he only knew three, so this is leading him up to the whole sort of Osiak Bone Reapers. He knows all the spells there, he knows all the spells here, and when eventually, when the Nighthorn get a new battle tome, I do believe Nagash will be able to go in there like he does for the Osiak Bone Reapers. Or the Soul Black Grave Lords, probably more similar to the Soul Black Grave Lords, so it doesn't fit in as well, but it does go in there. Um, I believe we'll get access to all those spells as well. Definitely looking like a trend. Um, and then it goes on to the Invigorating Aura spell. So, invoking ancient necromantic rites, the caster bolsters their minions or returns them to cursed unlife. Invigorating Aura has a casting value of 8. Add 1 to the roll for each friendly Soul Black Grave Lords hero on the battlefield. If successfully cast, pick one friendly soul like Grave or Sumble unit, wholly within 18 inches of the caster. You can either heal up to three wounds allocated to that unit, or if no wounds are allocated to it, you can return a number of slain models to that unit that have a combined wound characteristic of three or less. The same unit cannot benefit from this spell more than once per turn. So again, just more ways to heal. And unlike the D3 from Deathly Invocation, this one is just a flat free, so that is nice, makes it more reliable. And then on to the spell laws that we have. So the first one we're going to look at is going to be the Law of the Vampires. And the number one spell we have is Blades of Shaiish. So the wizard summons a whirlwind of spirit blades to slice through the foe. Blades of Shaiish has a cast array of 5, it successfully cast roller dice for each enemy unit within 12 inches of the caster. And on a 3+, plus, that unit suffers one mortal wound. Now, when I go through on this review, I am going to be quite honest on my thoughts on the rules. And in this particular case, this spell, don't like it. Yes, it's sort of like area damage, that one mortal wound, but I wouldn't take this over another spell that we have in the Law of the Vampires particularly. So, don't really like Blades of Sarish. If you have to take it, take it. But 
Going on to the next one, we have number two, which is Spirit Gale. So the wizard calls forth spectral winds that howl through the ranks of the enemy, tearing their souls from their bodies. Spirit Gale has a cast value of five. He successfully cast pick one enemy unit of innate signatures of the caster that is visible to them and roll a 2d6. If the roll is greater than that unit's bravery characteristic, that unit suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to the difference between its bravery characteristic and the roll. Now the problem you find is that yes there are some good examples of enemy with a low bravery but there are plenty of examples of enemies with high bravery. Like if you go against Zeech for example and Zeech Demons, bravery 10. Any death army, bravery 10. Seraphon for the most part, well half the part I suppose, Starborn, bravery 10. So this spell is unreliable, it kind of just reminds me of like basically you're turning a hero or wizard really, a vampire to be honest into um, a banshee but what i will say is that bear in mind if you are taking the gash um he has access to all of this so it might be useful particularly on the army you're taking but it's just unreliable unless you know you're going against i don't know gloom spike gits um you know oracle war clans anything with terrible bravery skaven unless you know you're going against them it's not really worth it and then going on to number three we have soul pipe so the caster places a hex on the foe so that should they move too aggressively, they risk impaling their own souls on a shivering forest of purple black spears. And what I just want to say is, although some of the spells we've read through so far haven't actually been that good in the rules, their lore has been very, very cool. So going on to Soul Spike, we have a cast of of 6. It successfully cast pick one enemy unit within 8 inches of the caster that is visible to them until your next hero phase. If that unit makes a charge move, Roll a number of dice equal to the charge roll for that unit. For each 4 plus, that unit suffers one mortal wound. The same unit cannot be affected by this spell more than once per turn. So again, unless you know you're going against a very aggressive enemy army, um, it's a good spell because that 4 plus to do the mortal wound. It's almost like um, there was some rule, I can't remember what army it was for. I think it was for the new chariot we've got for the Stormcaster turns where when it charges, it rolls a number of dice equal to its charge roll, and on a 4-up it does a mortal wound to the enemy. And, um, which is just better than the Slaves Darkness Chaos Chariot, which I think is quite offensive. But anyway, um, this is that, but the other way around. So, I do like it, but again, I'm thinking maybe this is more of a Nagash thing to do, because it's like, situational, and then it could be really nice. Um, rather than taking it over some of the better spells in the Lord of the Vampires. Because, going on to the next one, number 4, is one of my favourite ones, which is Amethystine Pinion. So, this does is has a casting value of 5, it's successfully cast on 2 units hero phase, add 6 to the caster's move characteristic, the same unit cannot benefit from this spell more than once. So why does it say it cannot benefit from more than once? Bear in mind that when we go through all these spells and all the ones that you've read so far, is that if you get that 9 plus casting value, so that unmodified of a 9 plus for the low Shaiish, um, spells or the spell laws of Sobolet Grave Force like we read out, you get to do the effect twice. So you won't be able to make your guy move an extra 12 inches, um, unlike in the Legion of the Gash where I think you plus 5 to your move and then um, you could stack it though on the same one so you can have uh, your guys moving very fast and here it's just going to be a flat 6. But I do really like this, movement is key, movement is one of the ways you win Age of Sigma. So being able to really help your guys moving is absolutely fantastic, especially like a Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon, it's moving 20 inches. Right? It's really, really good. There are other things you can stack in this um, book to make you guys move even faster. So yeah, I do like um, Amethystine Pinions, it's definitely one of my favourites. And then at number 5 we have Vile Transference, and it's important to say that the rules written in the Bash Tome have now changed, as in the FAQ this spell did get updated again. So let's see what it has to say. So Vile Transference is a spell that has a cast and value of 7. It successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within 3 inches of the caster, and that is visible to them, and roll a number of dice equal to that enemy unit's wound characteristic. For each 6 that unit suffers 1 mortal wound, and you can heal 1 wound allocated to the caster. So essentially what this means is that it used to be better in Legion of the Gash, in my personal opinion, but in this case, it's going to be great for when you can go against a Mega Gargan or something. You know, it'd be more useful then, but most things, not particularly good. Um, I mean, enemy monsters, depending on their wound characteristics, it could be good. But 
The important thing to note here is that I'm pretty 100% sure that when it says a unit's wounds characteristic, it doesn't mean, well, there's, I don't know, 20 grots in a unit, and that means that's 20 dice you roll because there's 20 wounds in total. What it means is it means it's characteristic. Like, for example, a unit's characteristic is Bravery 8, not 8 times how many models are in that unit. So, good against things with high wounds, not a good against most other things. So, shame, really. But then going on to number 6, we have... Amafine Orb. So, a Amafine Orb has a casting value of 6. It successfully casts pick one point of the battlefield within 9 inches of the caster, and that is visible to them, and draw an imaginary straight line 1mm wide between that point and the closest point of the caster's base, and roll a dice for each unit that has models passed across by this line. On a 2 plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. Deaf units are not affected by this spell. So, the deaf units are not affected by the spell. That's just, you'll find that a few things in this book are a bit like that because they're meant to be anti living. Um, this spell is worse than what it used to be because it used to be uh, d6 mortal wounds. Um, but I think that was on a 4 plus, so it might average out the same. Um, but this could be, you know, if you manage to cast this off twice and you get that unmodified 9 plus cast and roll, um, this can do quite a lot of damage. So, how I tend to hand out these spells is that obviously depending on your strategy and who you want to have the spell or not, but the two spells I would definitely pick from here um, is Amethyst Iron Pinions, just for that really good movement, and then Amethyst Orb because of that damage potential. Um, so those are my two favourite spells in the Lord of the Vampires, and that surprisingly you think, you know, vampires being more superior and powerful than Death Mages, i.e. Necromancers and so on, the Law of the Death Mages is, I believe, definitely better than the Law of the Vampires because it contains so many debuffing spells, right? And just to say, when we go on to the Law of the Death Mages, there's Nagash, Mortarts, and Death Mages, Wizards only. So you might think, oh, but on the Vampire, the Law of the Vampires, it said just Nagash and Vampire Wizards, but doesn't include Mortarts. Just bear in mind that the Mortarts in this book are already Vampires, right? So Manfred and Nefertiti, so they don't need to be specifically stated that their keyword can take this as well because they already have the vampire keyword so just something worth noting i think but going on to the lord of death mages the first spell we have is overwhelming dread so the target of this curse is overcome with a sensation of creeping doom causing them to cower in fear overwhelming dread has a casting value of five it successfully cast pick one in the unit been 80 inches of this caster that is visible to them and two your next hero phase subtract one from hit rolls for attacks made by that unit. So it used to be subtract one from hit rolls and subtract one from bravery, so it has got worse. And bear in mind how easy it is to plus to your hit rolls these days. Overwhelming Dread is definitely not as useful as it was in second edition and Legions and Gash. So just bear that in mind. And going on to the next one, which was a favorite, is Fade in Vigor. So the wizard saps the vitality from their enemies until they can barely raise their weapons. Fade and Vigor has a cast and value of 6. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within 18 inches of the caster that is visible to them and subtract one from the attack characteristics of that unit's many weapons to a minimum of 1 until your next hero phase. This, in new edition, is definitely better than Overwhelming Dread in my opinion. Yes, you might go against enemies with only one attack, so it doesn't matter, but most enemy units probably have more than one attack anyway. Um, so I do like this, I do think it's good. However, Fade and Vigor as well used to be able to make the enemy um, go from rolling two dice to charge to rolling one dice to charge. So this is really quite significantly hit again, but I think that could be just safely said for all the spells in the um, Spell Lords for the Soulblight Greenfords. Overall, they have got worse, but I do think they were particularly quite good and quite strong anyway, and I think they still are good, but there's no way of saying that they are definitely overall have got worse. But going on to number three, which is one of my personal favorites and probably my most used spell when I play Legion of the Gash, is going to be Spectral Grasp. So with a gesture, the caster summons a dozen of spectral hands into existence that grasp and hold nearby enemies. Spectral Grasp has a casting value of six. If successfully cast, pick one terrain feature wholly within 18 inches of this caster that is visible to them, and to your next hero phase, half the move characteristic rounding down of enemy units that start a normal move within three inches of that terrain feature. I think this is fantastic. Like I say, controlling movement, be it your movement or the enemy's movement, is one of the key ways to win Age of Sigma. So this is a spell that I always thought was fantastic. And when you cast this on a unmodified 9+, plus, it's brilliant because you can pick two terrain features that 
might be close to the enemy in sort of turn one and then you can affect most of their army by only making the move half. And if you're looking at things that have a move cash list of five, which are the fair few things like that in the game, that is going to go down to two and a half, and then it's going to actually be rounding down so that their movement was five and now it's two inches, which is just really, really good. The only sort of thing I would say is this kind of does make a little bit of a feel bad thing for your opponent because you basically onto your opponent, you can't move now, um, which does kind of suck. But you know, if you're playing competitively, um, definitely can't recommend this spell enough. And it hasn't, as far as I'm aware, got any worse um, in this new book compared to the Legions of Nagash, which makes a nice change. And then number four, we have Prison of Grief. So the caster curses his victims to relive the greatest tragedy in their lives, drowning their will to fight in waves of sorrow and self-pity. So Prison of Grief has the cast and of 6. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within 12 inches of the caster that is visible to them. And two in next hero phase, roll a dice each time that unit attempts to move. On a 5+, plus, that unit cannot move in that phase. The same unit cannot be affected by this spell more than once per turn. So that basically means if you get on that, I'll modify 9+, plus. you can't just stack this on that unit so you roll two fives up, basically, to try and stop doing anything. Um, I think this is really good because, again, exactly the same reasons why I said for Spectral Grasp for affecting your enemy movement. Um, it really shuts them down. It can, like I said, it can win you games. But I do prefer Spectral Grass overall because Spectral Grass is going to have more use to it. Whereas the Prison of Grief um, is great, but it is that five up that you do need. And it's not like Better Call where they need to roll five up to be able to do anything. You need to be able to roll that five up to stop them doing what you want them to do, which in this case is that movement. Um, so I still really like it, but Special Grass for the anti-movement one is still my favorite. And then number five, we have Decrepacy, I think it's pronounced. So the wizard causes the muscles of an enemy champion to a trophy, robbing them of their strength. So it has a cast of of 6, it's successfully cast, pick one enemy hero within 80 inches of the caster that is visible to them, and two in next hero face, subtract one from wound draws for attacks made by that model, and subtract one from the damage crash of that model's and many weapons to a minimum of one. So I really like this, and specifically for if you're taking the gash, and you're probably thinking you're going to go against big enemy monsters, etc. Being those heroes, you know, Stonehorns, Archaeons, etc. This is going to be good because you're probably going to be sending the Gash potentially after them anyway because it's so survivable. So you're now making him even more survivable by doing this to the enemy. And I subtract one from the wound rolls, whereas compared to Overwhelming Dread, where I subtract one from hit rolls, and I said that, well, you've got all that attack and stuff that you can just use to sort of negate that. Um, there's not many ways to get pluses to wound, generally in Age Sigma. So um, yeah, I do like this spell, but it is quite specific. It is against those um, enemy heroes, but it doesn't mean that you have to be like a big monster yourself. You can put it on to, uh, let's say, like it's, again, a great example, you know, Archaeon, etc. Um, and it's still going to help him out. It doesn't mean that the hero who put it on him now has to go and do the damage to him, etc. It can just generally be a nice spell. So I do like that. And then number six, we have Soul Harvest. So the caster summons a ghostly scythe. That slices through their enemies, cutting the cord, tethering a spirit to flesh. Soul Harvest has a cast and value of 7, is successfully cast. Each enemy unit within 3 inches of the cast suffers D3 mortal wounds. In addition, for each mortal wound inflicted by that spell as not negated, roll a dice. For each 5 plus, you can heal one wound allocated to the caster. Now, I used to really like this um, in Legion of the Gash, and I thought it was better than. The old vile transference and then later i realized that the old vile transference is better um, than the soul harvest but now um, as vile transference like i say it's, it's not really great depending on what you're going against i think soul harvest is pretty good um put it on the gash he's got a good base size for the enemy to be surrounding him trying to kill him as an example why i often did as i used to do this and if you roll that luckily enough to get the nine plus unmodified when you cast in you're basically doing two shock waves of this and going boom boom and that means that that's quite a lot of more wounds you're doing to the enemy and quite a good amount of chance of you healing wounds back, which um, is absolutely fantastic, I think. But then again, cast phase 7, so I wouldn't really probably take this on anyone who hasn't got great chances of casting. So I probably would only take this on um, Nagash from the experiences I've had. So looking at that overall then, so we've gone through the spells for the Death Mages. So what are my favourite ones? So my favourite ones are going to be Spectral Grass. Um, Fade and Vigor, um, Decrepacy, like I said, I think that's how it's pronounced, and then Prison of Grief. 
as like a sort of like ones that you would take just generically that are good. Whereas uh, Soul Harvest, like I said, I think it's good for Nagash and Overwhelming Dread. I think the enemy can just negate it. But what this does show is that from my personal preference, um, and my personal opinion, like I always say, the Death Major spells overall are better than the Lord of the Vampire spells just because like there's four there that I said that could have good use um, on average, whereas the Lord of the Vampires it was kind of mainly just two. So with that, what would I say are the best spells from both laws? Because just bear in mind that you might take more targets that can choose from both, so it's not as simple as, well, my Necromancer can only choose from this one, so there's no point looking at Lord of the Vampires. Let's say if you've got you know more targets that can choose, what would you go for? What do I think are the best spells in total? I think Amethystine Pinions is overall my favourite spell, and then followed by Spectral Grasp, and then followed by Fading Vigor, which is closely tied to Prison of Grief, and then Decrefacy, um, and then Soul Harvest. It's just like a general sort of idea. Again, it depends on your strategy and everything else, but just as an overall, they're the sort of ones in order I would go for. And with that, guys, that's actually going to be the end of this video. So the end of part one for the Soul by Grave Lords is their army review for this long and deaf army series, like I was saying, in terms of their rules. Again, we've already done the lore video, so you can go check that out if you'd like to. And um, beyond everything else, guys, I hope you really enjoyed this video here today. In the next video, we'll be talking about the sub-allegiances, the dynasties, and the legions for the Soul Blight Grave Lords. So really tailor how you want your army to work. Now that you know that this is basically just overall, no matter how you want to build your Soul Blight Grave Lords army, these are the rules you get for the battle traits. In the next video, we're going to look at how you can really tailor it to your personal choice and opinions on how you want to build your army. So as always, guys, if you did enjoy the video, please smash the like button and massively helps out the channel. It really shows to me that, especially on these videos, that I put quite a lot of time reviewing every single piece of the rules, um, that the time is all worth it. And it helps um, the channel on YouTube to hopefully recommend this video to people who aren't aware of the channel. And if you could smash that subscribe button for me as well, what that shows is that basically at the end of the day that's how the channel gets bigger the bigger the channel gets the better the quality gets as always and then if you smash the bell notification if you are watching this video at this moment in time presume you're very interested in soul grave lords and my review of them so this means that you will never miss the soul blight grave lord reviews when they come out or any of the other series that you enjoy that i do on the channel here and i would massively appreciate if you could smash that bell and um of course as always if you want to say anything in the comments, if you've got any more questions on the Soulblight Gravelords, um, in this video specifically tailored around the battle traits, that would be great, and the allegiance abilities, but if you've got anything else, let me know that down below in the comments. And if you've got anything you'd like to say that you agree with me on, or also if you disagree with me, at the end of the day, I'm not the best Soulblight Gravelords player here. I'm sure there's going to be other people out there with more experience with that army than myself. Let me know that down below because at the end of the day, I'm going to learn something and other people watching this video will learn something. But all I'd say is if you do a disagree, make it constructive and then we can all learn from that. And if you feel like you know someone who would enjoy this video, make sure you share it with them. If you want to talk more Soul Black Grave Lords, definitely join the Discord. There's a link to it in the description of this video and that will mean that you can join the Discord. Amazing community. We've got over 350 members. We've got quite a few Soul Black Grave Lord players in there and they definitely do like talking about tactics, list building, and everything else for the Soul Black Grave Lord, so you won't want to miss out on that. And what I'd like to say as well is if you would like to support the channel that step further, please consider clicking the join button, which will allow you to become a member here in Asian Gash. We can give anything from just one pound a month, or please click the link at the top of the description down below to my Patreon where you can give anything from just one dollar a month. That goes straight towards keeping the channel going. At the end of the day, like I always say, if this was a business, you know, YouTube doesn't pay that much um, every month I'd be losing money. But when you guys give me personal support like that, it really allows me to keep this going and justify everything I put into the channel. And if it wasn't for people who were really kind, and I'm going to read their names out in a moment, um, you wouldn't be hearing me talking to you right now. So if you could do that, guys, that would be incredible. And the people who did make that amazing decision are... My biggest supporter, who is going to be Philco, who is at the end of the day an amazing champion. He is a vampire lord on Zombie Dragon. What more is there to say? But no, seriously, he gives a huge amount of support to the channel. So thank you so much, Philco. And thank you so much for just generally being so generous and such a nice person. And then, of course, my Morgoths, who are going to be Bleed Red, the Mortark and the Acropolis, and Edward P. It's a really kind and very generous amount you were giving towards the channel, all three of you. So thank you three so much. 
the continued support at that level. It really does not go unnoticed. And then going on to my vampires, we're going to be Ben C, Rash321, David A, Dragoon Nitty, Ronnie H, Darren L, Spare Bear, Christopher H, North Drop, Nathan F, Andrew G, Tom W, Wiggy Hooty, Nathan S, and Carl W. Thank you all so much. Well, I always say the vampires are the core that keeps Asian Agash going. Very kind, very gentleman out you're giving to the channel. So thank you so much. And just a special announcement to Carl W. It's a brand new vampire. So thank you so much for deciding to make that decision and help support the channel. It's because of you and everyone else who I'm reading out here is the reason I'm making these videos. So thank you, Carl, for making that decision. I really do appreciate it. Then going on to my necromancers, who is Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolfnick, Michael W, Cranky Wombat, Tom M, Christopher C, Krista F, James S, Thomas B, Steve T, James T, Patrick F, JJ, R, Christopher, Seption, Arnold G, and Sean S. Thank you all so much for allowing me to keep this up and to try and help get as many people into our amazing community of Warhammer Age Sigma and to continue their journey through Warhammer Age of Sigma at the end of the day. And if anyone likes to support the channel in this way, like I say, click the join button next to the subscribe button or click the link to my Patreon on the top of the description down below where you can give anything from just £1, $1 up. And I know that sounds like a really small amount to start with, but honestly, it makes a huge difference. So if you could do that, I'd be massively appreciative. And um, like, basically, it'd be amazing and it really would help me out. But if you can't do that, no worries at all. But all I do ask if you do enjoy the content is smash the like button, the subscribe button, and the bell notification. Hey, it's absolutely free to do so. And if you think you are already subscribed, double check just because YouTube sometimes likes to unsubscribe for some weird reason. That would be great. And above anything else, guys, I'm really glad that you came to check out this video today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're really looking forward to the rest of this series of the Soul Black Rave Lords as much as I am. And remember until next time to stay safe, stay hygienic, make sure you wear a mask, and for God's sake, wash your hands. So that means that you're going to have better luck when you're rolling your dice with Soul Black Grave Lords. Otherwise, you'll just roll nothing but ones. You won't be able to re-roll them. And then beyond everything else, as always, guys, remember until next time that Negash is all. And all is one. In the gash.